The Nile has always been at the heart of human civilization. But the world's longest river is now dividing three countries that share its waters. A huge new dam being built in Ethiopia is causing trouble downstream. I'm Alastair Leithhead and we're travelling through Sudan, where the river's great tributaries meet for part two of damming the Nile. We'll see some ancient history at Kamakol as the river meanders north through Aswan. Egypt is fiercely against the dam. They believe the country's very existence depends on who controls the Nile, as it flows up through Cairo into the Delta and out to the Mediterranean Sea. Welcome to Sudan. This is our second stop on our journey down the Nile. This is the Blue Nile flowing in through Khartoum and this is the White Nile. They both meet and then head up here north towards Egypt. It's come about a third of the way from its source to the sea so far and we're here to investigate whether or not Sudan is going to gain from this big dam that Ethiopia is building upstream. Is it going to help as they come out of these US sanctions that have been in place for many years? Or is it going to reduce the amount of water they need for agriculture? Because Sudan could become a breadbasket for Africa. This might as well be the American Midwest. That's where they got the idea for these huge irrigation schemes. This is alfalfa, which makes top quality cattle feed. They harvest nine times a year and export to the Gulf. It's owned by the Dahl Group, which does everything from agriculture to mining, from cars to healthcare. Sudan's got plenty of land, but also needs water. And so the Nile provides. The pumping station on its banks sucks up water to keep the irrigation canals full. Sudan has the right to billions of gallons every year, but could always use more. Osama Daoud owns the Dahl Group and is Sudan's richest man. We met on his golf course. For Sudan, it's wonderful. I mean, it's really the best thing that has happened for a long time. And uh, I think the combination of energy and regular uh, water levels is, is a great blessing. That means cheap electricity. And it can cost a lot keeping your cows air conditioned. Yes, those metal funnels at the back are actually cow air conditioning units. And regulating water levels is important. When the difference between low water and high water on the Nile can be as much as eight meters. What do you think about the row between Ethiopia and Egypt over this dam? The Nile is the lifeline of Egypt. So for them, you know, it's, uh, they're, I wouldn't say paranoid, but they're very uh, concerned about anything that to do with that water. The atmosphere is changing at the moment in the capital Khartoum. Decades-long US economic sanctions have just been lifted. There's a cool pavement cafe culture where everyone hangs out and chats. We're here doing a story on the Nile, uh, on the river, and uh, the dam that Ethiopia is building uh, upstream. Is that something that you've heard about or know about? Yeah, what do you think about it? They're all mostly in favor of it, saying it'll give Sudan cheap electricity. But because Egypt gets the bulk of the Nile's water, it's not going to be great for them. One guy said he thought too many dams were generally bad, and you've got to think about the people living on the banks of the river. Everyone has to share the Nile equally. It's good for us, but it's bad for the Egyptians. I mean, the flow will be like so slow for them. For the Egyptians? Yeah. But to properly understand the river, you have to follow its flow. Welcome to Kamakol on the banks of the River Nile, a 
about half a day's drive north of Khartoum. You could probably just about make out the river there behind those trees. The reason we've come here and are putting up with these thousands of horrible flies is because this village was abandoned about 20 years ago. You can see the, the thick mud walls, no roofs to the houses. And the reason people left and moved inland was because of the flooding. You saw how far away the river was. Well, this would get regularly inundated, so it wasn't worth them staying here anymore. The difference a dam makes is to regulate that flow so it doesn't flood so much. So that means that people can come back. And the way they're trying to encourage them back is by holding a cultural festival. Three weeks of events, art and workshops, cinema and performances in the abandoned houses, bringing local villages and international visitors together. And what better way to do that than holding a camel race in the desert? This guy galloped ahead and pretty soon had left all the other riders for dust. I don't know, but maybe his mates had some money riding on him. They were all over it and loving every minute. some great acts to Kamakol. All the music you've just been hearing came from this concert. And you might have heard of Sinke. He's Sudanese, but has made it big in New York. And this was a real homecoming. They'd never heard anything like this here before. Back to the river and our story. Our crew filmed Mutaz Musa Abdallah Salim, Sudan's Minister for Water Resources, Irrigation and Electricity. I asked about the Ethiopian dam and the big picture. I mean, uh, water in general is, is becoming highly politicized, not only in this region, but elsewhere. And, uh, but I think if there is always, as our case here yeah, between the three countries, if the political will is, is around, uh, in involving the uh, high-up uh, authorities in the three countries, I think it will work out. Diplomatic, eh? But it's far from sorted. Sudan's backing Ethiopia, mainly for the cheap power and regulated flow it's going to get. But Sudan has separately fallen out with Egypt over how much water it can use. The regional rivalries go back to the time of the pyramids, the Sudanese pyramids. This is Jebel Burkal, and these are about 2,000 years old. For a short time in history, the Nubian Kush Empire ruled Egypt from here. This was their capital. Powers rise and fall, but all are linked by one great river. Welcome to the next stop on our trip, Egypt, and what a way to see it. The sun is just coming up, it's about half past six in the morning, and we're in a hot air balloon drifting over the Luxor Valley. The Valley of the Kings is just behind us. Uh, all these temples below us are just a, a flavour of ancient Egyptian history. We're here to try and understand why it is that Egypt is so opposed to this dam that Ethiopia is building so far upstream. More of that in a bit, but for now, enjoy the view. The pharaohs used to worship the river as a god. 
Egypt, they said, was the gift of the Nile. Civilizations flourished here on the banks of the river. These temples represent thousands of years of wealth and power. They're part of Egypt's proud national identity. You don't take something so set in stone and accept another country damming the Nile upstream and threatening your lifeline. Wahabi is 60. He's been a fisherman on the Nile for 40 years, like his father and grandfather before him. Our life and our livelihood depends on the Nile. We as a family live by the river. We fish. We grow crops on the islands in the Nile. Our cattle are fed from the Nile. All our food is from the Nile. Wahhabis heard about the dam in the Egyptian media, that Ethiopia wants to control the Nile and its flow will be affected. But he's skeptical. Water is from God and nobody can control it. Not you, not me. They say the water will get warm to be affected, but only God knows what could happen. If they dam the river, there will be wars and fighting. even bigger concerns downstream in chaotic Cairo. Egypt relies on the Nile for almost all its water, but the population is growing fast. And the United Nations is warning that because of wastage and pollution, there'll be water shortages by 2025. Egypt's water resources minister, Mohamed Abdelati, agrees it's a problem. And although they're recycling water, the two biggest threats to the country are climate change and the actions of countries upstream. So how angry are you? I'm extremely angry because, uh, you know, we are responsible for a nation that is about 100 uh, million. Just one uh, key thing that I would mention to you, if the water that's coming to Egypt reduced by 2%, what, you know what, the, what does this mean? Loss about 200,000 uh, acres of land. One acre at least uh, uh, makes one family survive. A family in Egypt, the average family size is about five persons. So this means that about one million will be jobless. He says that means more migrants heading to Europe and more people to be recruited by terror groups. Not all is calm on the Nile. Ethiopia said it was planning a dam, but started building a much bigger one without telling Egypt in the middle of the Arab Spring. Well, it's pretty misty in Cairo this time of year, but you still get a pretty decent view of the Nile from up here on the hotel balcony. I suppose there's a reason why Egypt's so touchy about the Ethiopian dam, but they're so sensitive, we've struggled to get permission to even film here to, to tell the story. Politicians, even some former presidents, have talked openly about war, about bombing the dam. Now, that seems crazy, but the government doesn't want to come across as being weak. It seems okay with the level of public anger against this dam. There seems to be less emphasis on negotiation and more about tough talking. We're near the end of our journey at the Nile Delta, the center of Egypt's agricultural production, where its famous cotton is grown alongside crops like rice. Irrigating fields by flooding them is one reason so much water is wasted. The delta is sinking as the dams upstream stop the fertile silt from replenishing the land, the very reason the Nile floodplains were so productive. It's now polluted with chemicals and waste. Fish are dying and people are getting poorer. The salt water is moving upstream. It's sad to see how this great river ends up. Well, this is it. This is the place where the Nile finally reaches the end of its long journey. Just up there is the Mediterranean Sea. You can see the waves coming in here. This is salt water. You know, whatever Egypt says or does, this uh, Ethiopian dam is being built. It's not an idea or a plan, it's a thing. It can already control the flow of the Nile's waters. 
And I suppose Egypt's always been this country strong enough to be able to dominate those upstream, and that's now changing. In terms of war, well, that's always a very foolish and, and self-defeating way of, of trying to deal with a political crisis, and no one we've spoken to thinks it's really going to happen. But this is a really serious problem, and it needs to be sorted out quickly. I hope you've enjoyed what for us has been a fascinating journey. The Nile brings so much life to these three great countries. What they do with the river and how they resolve their differences will affect the millions of people whose lives depend on it for water.